Welcome once again, comrades of the Union, as the workday comes to an end and the sun sets on our glorious island. I invite you all to sit back and hear the news of the day and listen to the music of the soul here on The People's Voice. We begin our broadcast tonight with an ongoing domestic story we were unable to cover during last night's show. After more than two months of negotiation with the Trade Union Congress, the Welsh Coal Miners Union, or the WCU, have called for a general work stoppage and strike at all coal mines in Wales. This marks the first major union strike in the Union of Britain since the 1925 general strike that sparked our glorious revolution. The TUC have moved to declare the strike illegal due to the current hostilities in mainland Europe and the Americas, whilst the WCU have released statements that outline their demands to the public. The chairman of the WCU had this to say this afternoon in Cardiff, and I quote, With so many of our comrades out fighting, a lot of my people are having to work two or more shifts in a row. Worksite accidents have gone up. All we want is some fair compensation for our labour and injuries. End quote. Since the start of the strike, there have been several clashes between the strikers and police, such as one particularly violent clash in the small village of Cumfalinvig, where strikers are reported to have damaged buildings and police vehicles. Police were able to regain control of the village after a reported 100 individuals were arrested, and a further 19 were reported dead. The WCU has stated they will remain on this course until the TUC are willing to work with them, even with calls from other miners' unions for the WCU to halt the strike and come back to the negotiation table. It is, after all, for the good of the nation. We'll have a more in-depth discussion on the situation with tonight's guest after this. Please enjoy this jaunty take on an old classic. Tonight on the broadcast, we have a very special guest, Comrade Walter Peterson, the chair of the Metro London Regional Board for the Trade Union Congress. Welcome to the People's Voice, Comrade Peterson. Thank you for having me, Comrade. It's a pleasure to be here. First of all, I would like to give you the chance to speak on the TUC's current stance on this strike. It's been reported that there is a push to declare it illegal. Is that correct? Yes, the TUC is of the opinion that with the current military situation, this strike could have the potential to severely hinder our ability to defend the nation. Remember, even with the former king dead, we are still fighting his loyalists in Canada, and don't forget the campaigns in mainland Europe. 
How do you respond to those that have said the TUC are hypocrites? After all, the TUC came to power during the general strike of 1925. It is absurd. The strike of 1925, right, was the response of the common workers of Britain to the leaders of the time's harsh policies that were grinding the common man to dust. This strike by the WCU is just a play at trying to twist the screws on the TUC. Not only is it illegal, it's downright treasonous. And uh, what does the TUC have to say to the chairman of the WCU? who but hours ago threatened to have the WCU withdraw from the TUC altogether. It's a preposterous idea and it reeks of desperation. It also further illustrates the need to bring this entire ordeal to a close. I mean, that kind of talk could seriously hurt the unity of the nation. Is that why the TUC have called... I'm sorry, I, I just have to reiterate... That kind of language is exactly what the enemies of the revolution want, for us to be at each other's throats and for us to break apart from infighting. That certainly is true, comrade. But to my question, is this why the TUC have called for the police to harshly crack down on these strikers? I wouldn't use the word harshly. I would say it's proportional. See, let's not forget the property that has been damaged in many of these striking towns. Now, the police can't have a hand tied behind their backs right now with that kind of threat. For example, that small village yesterday. Kumf... Um... Um... Yes, thank you. Those people didn't die due to police actions. Those people died to their own inability to perform a non-violent protest. The fault there lies with the leaders of the WCU and their totally irresponsible actions. Even more so with this David's chap. Glau Davids, the foreman of the Nine Mile Point Colliery. Yes. You know he went as far as declaring the whole ordeal the massacre of Confilid... Of Conf... Kumvalinvik. Yes, thank you. Now, the TUC is not blind to the tragedy of what happened, nor is it unsympathetic to the families affected. But that kind of hyperbole gets us nowhere and only further divides us. That also extends to the problems being faced by the miners as a whole. Long hours and less than safe working conditions are not something the TUC wants for its members. And it was in the process of being looked into before this whole strike nonsense. So the negotiation table is still open? It always has been. If the WCU come back to the table with an attitude toward looking for solutions and not just demanding those solutions for complex problems, then the TUC would be more than happy to continue our dialogue. I'm sure many of our listeners are very happy to hear that, Comrade Peterson. It looks like we're coming to the end of our allocated time for this interview. Uh, do you have any parting words for our dear listeners. Yes, I do, comrade. And I again thank you for having me on. To everyone listening, whether you're at home after a long day of hard work or are still in the factory listening while you labour, this nation could not hope to exist without people like you. Every day we grow stronger because of people like you. Every day our enemies falter because of people like you. The union is made stronger and richer every day. And one day soon, we will be able to bring this peace to former enemies and walk hand in hand with all of humanity into a future of peace. Fine words, comrade. We'll be back shortly with some international news from around the globe. <laughs>
welcome back, comrades, to our international news block, where we report the goings-on of the world for the everyman. First, we will be looking just across the channel to continental Europe, where a recent story has been gaining the attention of everyone. With the forces of the Third International marching ever onward from victory to victory, the tyrant Kaiser is reported to have abandoned his wartime bunker east of Berlin. While en route to a secure area in eastern Prussia, his convoy was ambushed by local pro-syndicalist forces just outside of Tapiao. The force that has claimed responsibility for the attack call themselves the Prussian People's Liberation Army. This force has, in recent months, taken control of the city of Königsberg and much of the coastline of eastern Prussia. This force has also claimed to have taken the Kaiser prisoner and have him under guard in Königsberg. This claim has sparked a whirlwind of diplomatic talks with this group from many nations to try and secure the extradition of this tyrant. And our nation is no different. Earlier this week, Foreign Minister Clifford Allen stated the intention of the Union to push for the Kaiser's extradition to, quote, face the people's justice in the people's court. The Commune of France, the Combined Syndicates of America, and the Socialist Republic of Italy have also declared their intentions for extradition to their own court systems. This has led to diplomatic gridlock, as the Prussian People's Liberation Army has had an influx of foreign delegations and diplomatic wires it was not prepared for. This has also highlighted the currently very fluid nature of the various rebel movements in the German Empire. A somewhat humorous example of this is what happened with the Socialist Republic of Italy, addressing its requests to the Prussian People's Liberation Front, a group that as of four months ago ceased to exist after its members were killed in fighting along the white Ruthenian border. Currently, the PPLA has not indicated which, if any, nation they will extradite the Kaiser to. What is certain is the tyrant that has been plaguing this world will face justice very soon. Another story that once again shows superiority in our cause comes out of the Far East, from our comrades in the Indo-Chinese Union. 
it has been confirmed that the imperialistic Japanese government has declared war on the Indo-Chinese Union. Their emperor, not simply content with unjustly ruling over the Japanese people and the peoples of China and the East Indies, has now set his eyes on Indochina. However, unlike their conquests in the Philippines and the East Indies, they have been thrown back with a ferocity matching the spirit of the people of the Indo-Chinese Union. The Imperial Japanese military launched a surprise attack, much like they did a year prior on the Philippines, aiming to destroy the Indo-Chinese Navy at anchor outside the Ang Tao. Fortunately for the ships at anchor, a construction from the Union's past had been recently brought back into working order, a force that began its life under the flag of the illegal German East Asia Colonial Administration, known to the world now as the Concrete Battleship. This Concrete Battleship sits just half a kilometre from the shore, built upon a small sandbar, with walls 9.5 metres thick, and armed with four 350mm naval guns. This fort fired the first shots of the battle. A Japanese naval squadron moved into the territorial waters of the Union at 7 a.m. local time, as reported by naval patrol aircraft and local fishing boats. This squadron was made up of two fast battleships, five armoured cruisers, and a number of modern destroyers. It is not known currently if the Japanese knew of the fort being in working order, or if they did know but underestimated its abilities. What is known is that, a little after 8 a.m. local time, the guns of the concrete battleship fired, scoring a hit on one of the Japanese cruisers. Witnesses report seeing a bright flash from the ship as it was struck, and then seeing the cruiser sink slowly into the sea as two separate parts. Officials from the Indo-Chinese People's Navy state that the first hit on the Japanese cruiser was to the ship's main magazine, resulting in its almost instant explosion. What followed was 30 minutes of fire exchanged between the fort and the Japanese ships. The commander of the People's Navy Task Force that was stationed in Vaang Tao has gone on record stating that Fort Nguyen's resistance and expert gunnery were able to keep the Japanese force at bay long enough for their ships to weigh anchor. With one cruiser sinking to the bottom of the bay, and another of their fast battleships having suffered a hit to its bridge in a following salvo, the Japanese commander must have thought it better to run than stick about fighting the People's Navy, as soon the Japanese force turned about and had moved full speed back out to sea. The Indo-Chinese Union government have reported that 72 of their brave soldiers lost their lives in the battle. All are reported to have been issued the People's Star, the highest military honour in the Indo-Chinese Union, posthumously for their gallant sacrifice in the face of imperialism. With that, my comrades, we come to our midpoint break for this evening's show. Please enjoy this music to free your mind and steal your spirits.
Blades. Before we begin the second half of our show, I would just like to take the chance to remind everybody that, as we come to the end of the month, that many of the factory quotas are coming due. Remember, the kings and the kaisers of the world fear a nation of free and productive workers. Do not let down your fellow man and shirk your responsibilities by not meeting any quotas this month. The chains that bound our society for so long are so close to fully being broken worldwide, and we would not want to falter now. It is our duty, comrades, to work together, live together, fight together, and liberate together, for this is our union. And by working hard and meeting your quotas, you too can help free the world as honest and productive workers. On a lighter note than our last segment from Indochina, to all of our comrades in the London area, don't forget the exhibition game this weekend between Woolwich Arsenal and the Paris Red Star team. This will be the first football game in the Metro London area since the Second Weltkrieg began two years ago. All proceeds from this match will be going towards the Unity Tunnel Project, a tunnel under the channel that would connect Dover and Calais with a rail line. This project would finally unify our island nation with our comrades on the continent and help to further the cause of syndicalism around the world. The game itself will be covered live on this station for all those who cannot attend. Whilst being the first game in the Metro London area since the start of the war, it will also be the first match held at the new William F. Cluster Memorial Field. This field was named after a local boy that was one of the first killed in the general strike of 1925. A boy of just 15 that was killed in the crossfire when government troops violently tried to stop a force of striking workers. A fitting first match for this field, I would say. There are currently still tickets available for 95 pence for adults, and as a special offer, children under the age of 10 get in for free. So, if you would love to help fund a noble project for our future, or just to go and cheer on our comrades taking to the pitch, Get those tickets while they're still available. I know who I will be cheering for. Now for a piece that's a bit different to our normal, peaceful programming, but this piece has been making waves across the continent. And as we're promoting unity, I thought this radio show should too. We have one more international story for tonight's program. 
while our soldiers work with the forces of the Combined Syndicates of America and pro-syndicalist Canadian forces in the liberation of Canada from the misguided royalist forces on the other side of the Atlantic, we should take care not to forget the strength and sacrifice being shown in this far-off conflict. With this in mind, I would like to highlight one such story that has been getting much attention in the combined syndicate's press, and that has only recently made its way across the pond. Weeks ago, before the current siege of Vancouver, before our forces were able to break the Dominion's Fraser Line, and when our forces were still threatened by the prospect of being thrown back along the border. A small battle was fought. If lost, it could have resulted in our forces being delayed or even being outflanked. In the Canadian city of Surrey, units of the CS Army had been fighting street to street for months. The battle lines had been static, and any hope of a breakthrough had long since been snuffed out by the sounds of distant artillery and the clouds of ash from burning fires. Unknown to the Allied Syndicate forces fighting in the city, the Royalist Military Command had been building up for an attack to throw back our comrades from not only Surrey, but all the way back to the border. It is not currently known how large a force carried out this attack, as concrete information in such a fight is always hard to find. But when this attack was launched, it was met with the stubborn resolve of ours and our allies' soldiers. One such case of this resolve we will be focusing on is that of Corporal Jennifer M. Myers. Comrade Myers's unit had been posted along King George Boulevard for weeks, fighting off repeated Dominion attacks and keeping the road closed to enemy traffic. On the morning of the 17th of April, well, this was all about to change. Dominion forces began to move across the line, including towards Comrade Myers' position. Unlike most of the recent battles that Comrade Myers' unit have fought with the enemy, they now have to face heavy tanks with large amounts of infantry supporting. In one of the interviews Comrade Myers gave after the battle, they are reported to have said this. We could see infantry and tanks moving towards our position, just north of the city's blown-out hospital, from 98th all the way back to 104th Avenue. What ensued was six hours of harsh building-to-building -building fighting, the likes of which has rarely been seen before. The standout moment of the battle came when a column of Dominion tanks started a determined push to break through the thin CS line. This is where Comrade Myers comes into the story. She, along with 20 other soldiers from their original unit of 400, set up a killing field on either side of King George Boulevard. They waited in secret in the rubble of the buildings flanking the street. They waited in silence for the perfect opportunity to arise. And boy, did that opportunity come knocking. When the large column of tanks was in the perfect position, these brave soldiers used what little anti-tank weapons they still had left. Some are reported to have used makeshift firebombs. These firebombs are sometimes colloquially known as MacArthur cocktails, after their wide use by federal troops in the Second American Civil War. But now, our commune brothers use them to beat back royalist forces. This attack destroyed the first three and last two tanks in the column, thus trapping the royalist tanks on the street with nowhere to go. After a further 20 minutes of fighting between Myers' soldiers and the trapped tanks, the crews of the enemy vehicles put their hands up in surrender. The small group of CS troops, now down to just 15, took prisoner the 89 tank crewmen and their machines. While this victory is but one of many that day, it highlights the drive and the sacrifice these soldiers go through on a daily basis. 
I would be remiss if I did not take the time to talk about the soldier that had the most impact on this victory. While Corporal Myers has said that she was just doing her duty, and that the real heroes were those that could not be here today, it is a fact that due to her quick thinking, in the face of overwhelming odds, she and her ragtag group were able to stop what some have said may have been a crushing attack. A little bit of information about our comrade Myers here. As a native of Des Moines, Iowa, she first signed up to the CS Army when the Civil War was afoot, and apparently she was one of the first to sign up in her state. Even with the end of the Civil War, she stayed enlisted in the Army as she felt, and I quote, she feels the need to help those that need help, and to break the chains that bind many around the world. Quite the soldier, a true paragon for all of us workers to look up to. Comrade Myers received the Workers' Service Medal with Combat Star for bravery in the face of enemies to the people of the CSA. Rightly deserved and well done her. And now we have a piece of music that came out of the syndicates during their civil war. This beautiful piece will really get the red spirit going. And that, comrades, takes us to our last story for tonight's program. A new ship has been commissioned into the Union Navy. And not just any ship. The Oliver Cromwell is not only the most modern aircraft carrier in the Union Navy, it is also the first aircraft carrier to be 100% designed by Union engineers. This is due to the fact that after our glorious revolution, Many ships remained unfinished in the shipyards and slipways of our nation. This allowed our navy to quickly grow and helped defend our fair nation far sooner than it would otherwise have. Since this time, our navy has designed and built new classes of ships, but we were yet to produce a fleet carrier that is Union designed. Until now, that is. As of two days ago, the first of the Cromwell class fleet carriers have been commissioned. These ships displaced at 32,000 tons, and have an effective top speed of 31 knots. What truly sets these ships apart from those that have come before it is the capacity of the aircraft which they can carry. With 55 planes in their standard complement, 
they have almost doubled the capacity of any other carrier in the Union fleet. The commissioning was carried out after over a month of fitting out and a successful shakedown cruise. It is expected that the Oliver Cromwell will join one of the many naval task forces that is currently patrolling the Baltic coast of the German Empire. It has also been reported by the Navy that the Cromwell's sister ship, the Thomas Fairfax, is on time and could be ready for commissioning in as little as seven months. These ships, along with two others of their class, are expected to become the backbone of the Union Navy in the years to come. If you would like to catch a peek at this majestic ship, it will be making a small tour along the South English coast on its way to posting later this month. The Oliver Cromwell will be starting the tour from its base at Plymouth and then stopping at Southampton, Portsmouth, Dover and then finally resting in Chatham where it will remain until posting. Once again comrades we come to the end of our show. As we begin to close out this broadcast I would like to remind everyone that even as the enemies of our Union plot and scheme to destroy our way of life, that our nation must stand firm before these misguided peoples, knowing that one day we will bring the light to these enslaved and chained people, that one day we shall truly break the chains. Good night, comrades. Pass the ammunition. Follow, like, subscribe, or support us on Patreon. Hello, everybody, and thank you for listening to forward slash watching episode two of Radio Kaiserreich, our long form alternate history radio broadcast. We would like to thank all of our Patreon backers, Discord members, and webshop customers. This season we are welcoming several new patrons. Thanks to all new patrons, Sierra Tango, Mitchell McDonald, Arnold Thunberg Mandeville, Christian Smith, Tree Shaker Trucker, Cassia, Tom Servo, and Andrew Brown. Of course, we would be remiss not to mention all of our patrons together. So we have Alexander, Daniel Smith, DePrusen, Cassia, Lobster Man of New England Gang, Luke Downer, Mr. Knowledge, Sierra Tango, Zarko, Ben Davenport, Berg Kimberly, Chloe Aaron, Mitchell McDonald, Noah Humphrey, Patrick Allen, Russell Apfel, Scoop, Tiber 109, Jan Brand JS, Andrew Brown, Andrew Duran, Arnold Thumberg Mandeville, Brandybuck, Christian Smith, Higgins the Seagull, Julio R.K. Martins, Lucas Cromberg, Matthew Schwartz, Michael Fury, Mojot Gen Gen 55, NS, Pablo Fernandez, Quinn Curtis, R2D2 Chauncey, Sarah Parker Schmidt, Shane Montoya, Sir Shake, Tom Servo, Tree Shaker Trucker, Trey Sambria, and Vincent Galliana. Also, thanks to our Discord Nitro boosters, Rusky Business, Panera, and For God, King, and Empire. We have also surpassed 2,400 orders on the webshop, so a big thanks to everyone supporting Kaiser Cat Cinema and the Kaiser Rank mod by buying the merchandise. We recently sent 25% of our first year's profits to the Kaiser Rank mod team, meaning the mod itself now has some budget lined up for 2020. That's all we have time for. I've been Alex forward slash Midgeman on the Discord. We wish you a happy holidays and we'll see you all in January. Ta ta for now, cats. Hello everybody and thank you for watching forward slash listening to episode 2 of Radio Kaiser Art. Ah. Outtakes. Outtakes. Maybe one point doing outtakes.